Hi. Hi. Hello, hello. Hello. Hi. Can't hear you, Alan. You should be able to. Now I can hear you. It was my fault. <laughs> um, while we're waiting for people, I'm going to just, oh, there's nine people in the, yeah. aha, I may switch them over. I'll be right back. While Henry's doing that, um, I just want to remind everybody that this is a live session now of our um, Public Shade Committee meeting. So this line, this uh, Zoom will be recorded and viewable again uh, after, I believe they post them after, at the end of the day on Friday. So you can rewatch it later if you like. <laughs> You're muted, Henry. All I said was, hmm. <laughs> well, hi, everyone. Um, let me just drag up the agenda. All right. Are we being recorded, Alan? Yes, we are. We're live. Okay. Being recorded. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we have some guests. We have, uh, I guess we have four people from the committee, five people from the committee. So we have a quorum. Oh, Sarah's here. Six. Okay, good. Um, yeah. So, yeah, um, we'll do a quick review of the agenda, then we'll open it up to some of the guests that are here. Um, I'll share my screen just briefly with the agenda. Can everyone see that? Yeah. So um, we'll move forward with the people who are here visiting, and then we'll proceed with the other topics. And everyone's welcome to stay and participate as much as they want, but at least to get started, we'll, we'll give you the opportunity to go first. So I'm gonna stop sharing and we'll um, go to that, okay. So I'm Henry Lappin, I'm the chair of the committee. Let's uh, go around Shoshana, just quick Hi. introduction. I'm Shoshana King, uh, committee member since I think 2018-ish. Okay, Ellen. Hi, I'm Ellen Kiter, and I am also a committee member for, I think, the past three years. Yeah. And Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Lawler. Um, I've also been a committee member for three years. Okay, and Britt? I'm Britt Crow Miller. I think I'm just past one year as a committee member. Okay, and Julian, are you still here? Hi, yes. Um, I, my name is Julian Hines. I am a committee member 
and I do the social media and I'm technically the vice chair. <laughs> okay. And I assume everyone knows Alan Snow, but you can introduce yourself, I guess. Alan Snow, tree warden. Okay. And then we have uh, visitors, uh, Sharon. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Sharon Cherry, the director of the Jones. And Henry, I didn't know if you could promote Jess and Rachel. I promoted her. She didn't take me up on that. Let me see if Jess is, uh, yes. Mm. Oops. I'll try again. Okay. Henry, do we have someone taking notes? Uh, Julian offered to do that. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Unless someone else would like to. Oops. <laughs> You can do it. So great. Um, all right. So Sharon, you introduce yourself, Rachel, former committee member. Hi, I'm Rachel Leffler, um, former committee member. Um, and with Berkshire Design and working with Sharon and Jess and um, many, many other people on the Jones Library renovation update. And Jess? Hi. Um, at the Berkshire Design, uh, working with Rachel. Uh, hi, Sarah. Hi, Robert. Okay. And Robert. So my name is Robert Ryan. I'm a uh, citizen of Amherst and a landscape architect. Okay. And there's a few people who are hidden. Does anyone else want to speak? No? Okay. Well, let's... Uh, Move on. Um, is everyone here for the library, all the guests? They are. So Bob Parent is a town uh, of Amherst. He's a uh, capital projects uh, planner. Uh, and Ginny Hamilton is the um, chair of our uh, capital campaign. Okay. So I'll let you take over this part of the meeting. Um, I have a quick spiel I thought I'd share with you, just a little bit of background, and, and then I'll hand it over to uh, Rachel and Jess. So okay. in um, so your knowledge, we probably have about 15 minutes for this. Uh, if we need more, we could do that, but okay. keep, keep okay. it shorter, it'd be good. Yeah, sounds good. So in April of 21, yeah. Town Council town council voted to approve uh, this project for the Jones Library building. And this vote was a culmination of more than a decade of careful planning and consultation to make sure that Amherst Library served the needs of all of the residents. The project calls for expanding the children's room, providing a much needed teen space, dealing with the inadequacies of our special collections and English as a second language facility, and making the building accessible for all Amherst residents. It will make the library a model for sustainability through the purchase of offsite renewables. It will be net zero while preserving and restoring the unique history of the Jones building. In addition, the expansion renovation project will address the serious maintenance and structural problems which plague the Jones. In order to pay for this project, which is now estimated at 43.9 million, the town will have to bond for only 15.8 million. And the remainder of the cost will be taken care of by the MBLC grant, which is the largest grant that they've ever awarded and our capital campaign. And to date, the trustees and friends have secured over $37.6 million toward this project. We expect to go out to bid in January of 2024, sign a contract with a general contractor in March, and then spend 18 months operating out of an interim space while construction occurs, and then we'll celebrate our grand reopening in December of 25. So that's just a little bit of uh, background information. The architectural firm that we've been working with is uh, Feingold Alexander Architects out of Boston, and they have contracted with Berkshire Design Group. And so I'd like to hand it over to Rachel and Jess. Thanks, Sharon. Um, and also, um, we should note that uh, that in terms of jurisdiction for the Public Shade Tree Committee, this is purely a courtesy presentation. 
there aren't any trees within the Jones Library property that are jurisdictional to the shade, Public Shade Tree Committee. There are some public shade trees in the right of way out front that will be protected throughout construction. So we're excited to share with you the process where we are at um, and also get your input on our current tree species selection and see if, if you guys have any other thoughts that we should be thinking about. Um, so I'll share screen um, and talk about um, the site today and then our vision for where, where it would be headed. Everybody see my screen? Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is an aerial view of, of the plans. And generally, as we're talking today, this is this is kind of our um, home base where we'll be looking. So north is up, south is down on the bottom of the page, Amity Street along the front, existing Jones Library. The red line is the property line. Um, on, on the west is the Amherst, Amherst Historical Society building. Um, and, and the north is the CVS parking lot. And then we have the Works Cafe and the fire station uh, to the east. Um, of note with the public, sh with shade trees in general, um, we, we know that the Historical um, Museum Stronghouse has the one of the oldest sycamore trees in the state. It's a heritage tree. I know there's been a lot of effort to help keep that tree vibrant and, and thriving. And we walked, we walked the site with Alan, I think it was in February, going through the plans and talking about the trees. And we were surprised to hear that the roots for this tree extend all the way, probably all the way to the edge of the existing library building, as do the Norway, Norway spruce. So our plans take into consider protecting those trees, protecting that root zone, um, and staying out of that area. Um, and if the contractor does go in that area, they have to first get permission from the historical society. In addition, they'd have to put down timber matting to help protect the tree roots in that time. Um, and as we were starting this process, um, we were uh, pulled up some of the old postcards um, that were created shortly after the library was constructed, and then just seeing how in those early early decades what the landscape was like. Um, and it's interesting how there are you know trees planted very close to the building, which can be a problem long term for some of those beautiful shade trees when they're really close and um, when roots start to grow into the structure and foundation. Um, that's one thing that we're wanting to avoid. And then uh, from site photos on site, I mean, looking at the front of the library, this is the Norway spruce we were talking about that would be protected. There's an existing, this is public shade tree, Norway maple. Um, there's another maple and then a London plane and then another tree, which we weren't sure if it was a mountain, a Korean ash, or if it was a crab apple here right on the corner. Um, and then up against the building. Black gum tree. Black gum, okay, thank you. Um, then up against the building. So that's those are the jurisdictional trees out front. Um, once we cross the sidewalk, we're completely on, on Jones Library property. So along the existing front of the building, um, there's some Chinese dogwood and a pagoda dogwood, um, and then lots of lilac bushes and rose bushes kind of overgrown and challenging for the library to maintain. Um, this is a view of that beautiful Norway spruce on the Historical Society property. It's big swooping branches um, that would be protected throughout construction. And then some existing dogwoods again on the on the west side of the library and some shrubs. And this is a view of that heritage sycamore tree. So that's the front of the building. And then in the back, uh, the landscape is um, kind of like a, a little bit more roly-poly back there. Um, you know, it's low at the CVS parking lot and the entry to the library today is down low, but then the historical society is six to eight feet above that area. And then in the middle, there's a big mound up. And when we were walking the site with Alan, um, he was showing us the age of the trees and the relationship to the grades. And we believe that the actually this area was cut down with the addition in 1993. Um, so in that area, there, there are, there's an old maple, an old oak tree. Um, they're thriving. One, the oak tree is actually thriving because its roots have grown into the sewer pipe. 
So we did um, early, we did a, a like a, a, a video scoping of both the drainage and the sewers lines out back. And there's definitely a root intrusion into the sewer line. And the sewer line is not of a size or a material that could be used long-term. Um, so that's one of the things we had to consider as we were looking at, at the plans. This is a proposed view of what we anticipate the front of the library to look like when it's complete. Um, so out front, these are the public hammer shade trees still in place, still growing, thriving. Um, we'd be one of the issues in the back, one of the trees is really struggling. The pagoda dogwood has very few branches on it. And the other one is growing uh, in, into the building and um, creating maintenance issues. So one of the requests from the library staff was to have a tree that would provide shade for them outside of this area. Um, and so we're proposing um, oxydendrum, um, sourwood tree, good native out here to provide shade and um, provide some seating. We're gonna keep the Chinese dogwood on the two corners of the building. And then out front, we would be proposing uh, two new yellow magnolia trees out front to mirror the building. Um, we would be taking down um, the Princeton Elm and um, I'll show you in more detail in the plans. In addition, um, so when we were looking at the trees here, we we're looking at trees in general that could handle hotter temperatures that are projected with climate change. So they're both northern and southern adapted. Um, and also thinking about um, seasonality and habitat and um, pollinator support. Um, this is a, a rendering view from, from the corner on Amity and North Prospect Street. Um, the render took a lot of license and showed us trimming the tree. So I would just like to clarify, if you see this image, we are not trimming the Norway spruce. We're not doing that. Um, but they did this so that you could see what the building, the addition would look like on the building. And then this is a view on the back side of the building. So the CVS entry, um, it's a new addition to support that much needed program that Sharon was talking about. Um, we have an open sight line to the to the entry down there. And then that area that I had mentioned before that was roly poly where the historical society is up and the pathway is down, um, we're actually going to be cutting, cutting the grades down and creating a stormwater um, area on site. So again, with climate change, um, we've seen the numbers for a hundred year storm increase, the, what we use in terms of design and engineering. So we're planning ahead always for the hundred year storm, making sure that we're not with any project that we're not releasing more water off property than we were before a project. Um, that's our due diligence. So the standard for that used to be six and a half inches. So a six and a half rainstorm would be a hundred year storm. Um, and the, the regulations have changed in this last year. So now we're, we're sizing things for 11 inch rainstorm, almost double. You know, and you think about those big rainstorms that we had in the last couple of weeks, those were six inches. So you can think almost twice that amount is something that we, um, we are required and we're happy, you know, really happy to support. What that means for this project, though, is because the site does take all the stormwater off of the historical society's property. I'll show you on the plan that this area um, and the area of the increased roof size, um, we needed we needed more capacity to hold things on site. And so the creating it as a, a feature that also could support um, pollinators and other habitat could be a place um, for garden. Stacking those layers and functions are something that's really important to us. Um, so in the, we're also going to be reusing as much as we can landscape materials on site. So there are lots of beautiful Goshen stone on site that are in walls and paving, some granite pavers out front. So we'll be integrating that into stone benches and also stepping stone paths um, in, in the North Garden and then um, granite bands and veneers. So again, trying to reuse things on site is really important to the project. Uh, and so Jess helped us put together a catalog of what's there on site. And you know, we did a lot of number crunching to see where we could put, put these and how we could integrate that into the paving. 
Um, our palette, plant palette out front is much more restrained, kind of keeping with the historical aesthetic in town and in New England. So we're looking at mostly evergreens with a little pops of color, little um, splashes of white and purples, and then those accent magnolias that we were talking about up front. Uh, again, trying to um, minimize the amount of perennials and weeding and mulching that would be required for the project. And then the north, we took inspiration from more of the woodland edge and wetland gardens with parrots and mosses and ferns. Um, and we'll be interspersing bulbs and other perennials in there, some sedums for that sort of low, low textured seasonal feel. It also can handle the dry and the wet. Um, so out front, this is an enlargement of the front plan again. So the main, we have a new main front entry. We have a fully accessible walkway that parallels the building now. Um, it's under 5%, so we don't need any railings. Um, it's fully accessible to the front and to the, the west side. We have a new children's courtyard area out directly off of the children's room. So, um, you know, families and children can read or have some of those amazing programs that, this, that the library offers to kids of all ages out there. And that area uh, will be surrounded by um, a dwarf rhododendron that maxes out about four feet high, the Cunningham White. Um, we'd be embracing that existing Chinese dogwood, and then that'd be framed by the by the buttercup magnolia. Um, this is the proposed sourwood tree in that corner for shade. And then at the back, um, we have, these are the new new main walkways to that north entry. And um, one of the comments we got from from the public was that the we needed something softer that the straight lines were less desirable. So we interspersed a walking meditation walking loop through the garden of the stepping stones that we're reusing from materials on site. We have seating boulders at destinations along the garden. And then we're weaving in different types of um, bulbs and crown cover. In this area, we're gonna keep the existing Norway maples at the north corner of the CVS um, property. And then we would be and we'd be protecting the existing maple by the existing shed. But we were thinking that we would um, try to find trees again that are Southern adapted, can handle the wet feet, can handle the drought. Um, so we're looking at willow oak, um, swamp white oak, and sassafras in this area to provide shade long-term and a little bit of uh, color with the proposed fringe tree. There are some existing trees on the historical property, again, up high that have grown into the library. And that's something that we would be coordinating with uh, the historical society to trim them properly and protect them during construction. And so this is what we just saw that view now looking at the plan. So this is a view looking from the CVS lot towards that new main entry. So you're standing here at the CVS lot looking towards that new north entry the stormwater garden um, over here would be the swamp white oak, existing shade tree, the new sassafras, the existing um, birch trees, and the new um, willow oak. And then that view from the front again, looking this way towards the Jones Library, the oxydendron sourwood, the new magnolias, and the existing Amherst public shade trees. So I think that's kind of the overview. Does anyone have any questions? I had um, two questions. <clears throat> One is, um, it looks like that back wall is going to get very, very hot, that area. You have seating back there, but I didn't see any trees shading it because of the rain gardens. Um, are there any trees in that area in the back, in the center? Yeah, let me, I probably should have kept sharing, sorry. <laughs> um, so you're talking about this area here? I can't quite see it in my... Um, the other way. The other way. Yeah, that... This wall here? Yeah, yeah. And, and to the right in the picture in front of that, yeah. Yeah, this area will be actually pretty shaded by the building. It is a three-story building. It's going to cast quite a bit of shadow. 
Um, we do have a sassafras here and the maple here. One of the challenges, and I could share, let me see if I, if you guys can see this, let me know if you can see this. Um, can you see this okay? Yeah. These are, our, um, we're about 75% through, through the drawing. So we've got, you know, mock-up of what the construction set would be. But in that back area, let me show you the utility drawing. Um, it's everything that's happening underneath that beautiful garden. So um, we've been calling it colloquially the stormwater sandwich. So we've got rain garden on top, and then we've got stormwater storage underneath um, here below the rain garden. So the rain garden water will filter into here and then infiltrate into this and then give it and it gives it more time to infiltrate below or go out to the city system. So that's what side those two things together are helping with that with that hundred year storm. So when we are when we're placing trees in here, we're trying to avoid that that area. So that kind of eliminates putting a putting a shade tree here or or here. And we've got a lot of dra drain lines coming out of the building from the roof and then drain lines leaving the building. Um, so that's one one of the one of the factors in really trying to um, integrate integrate shade into the area. But this area on the north side, we do think will be pretty heavily shaded by the building itself, just by its mass. And it faces north anyway, so it shouldn't receive direct sunlight, correct? Right. Correct, yes. And one question I had for both my minutes and so the public knows, how many total trees are planned to be removed from the Jones property here? And how many trees are planned to be added after the fact? <clears throat> I would need to count for you. I don't have that number offhand. Jess, okay. is that something that you could do while we're talking? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Might be helpful to have um, total inches in DVH removed. Um, just to give us an idea of the size of the trees coming down as well. Yeah. And I had one other question. You mentioned the Princeton elm that was going to be removed. Is that one of the shade trees out front or yeah. the street trees? I don't remember where that is. It's in front of the library, but not a public shade tree. Okay. <clears throat> It was um, Prince and Elm planted at an Arbor Day event um, back in probably 2010, 2009, around there. Um, it got pretty, pretty busted up by the October 2011 snowstorm and uh, we, you know, rebounded pretty well, but it has some very poor branching characteristics um, because of the way it was damaged. Um, but it's growing just fine. Yeah, go ahead. But it is on, it's on the Jones property, not the public way. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted, I mean, thank you for the presentation. It looks like a lovely project with lots of thought, um, having gone into it. Um, I just wanted to clarify. So the the very large oak tree currently kind of back by the CVS parking lot. Th those oaks are going to be removed, correct? Yeah. Let me let me pull up our um, our demo plan so you can be really clear about what what's happening. So you're asking about the trees in the back, right? So this is the existing rear of the library now here. And that existing asphalt walk with the little millstones. Can you yes. see that? Thing? Yep. Um, this is the existing maple that we're gonna keep that's by by the shed. And then this is the existing oak that's growing into the sewer line. That's the sewer line oak. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Additionally, the addition extends about halfway into that into that crown. So it'd be it'd be really challenging to save and um and you know not not a given that it would be able to be saved if we took them out, took out that much root 
someone from that tree. Um, then this this tree um, is up high, so that as I was saying, the really fully landscape. This is high. This is low. This is high again. It's maybe two to three feet higher than the walkway. Um, this is a beautiful tree, um, but it is for that for that climate change adaptation. Hundred year storm. Eleven inches of rainfall. Um, this area needs to needs to drop down to be a bowl to hold and collect the water rather than being raised up. And so that once we change the grades in that area, um, we have to we have to remove that tree because it wouldn't be able to withstand withstand that change in grade. So we're dropping it down another three feet below below the sidewalk level to hold all that water. I, this may be a silly question, but I'm curious if you all have done a calculation to see what a tree of that size would absorb in terms of runoff and if that is equivalent to the water to be held in that planned basin. Yeah, we haven't done that calculation. Um, so there, I guess there I have two thoughts on that. One is that is an interesting calculation um, and would love any resources that you would share for us to do that. Um, there's also the the regulations and the stormwater standards with the state that we have to comply with um, as due diligence. And so, unfortunately, the only way currently that trees engage with the state standards is in calculation of water runoff and cover. So trees are factored in when we look at our watershed analysis map. We do have to put in the areas of the tree canopy upslope and on site. The pre and post uh, for that for that calculation. Um, as far as an individual tree and what it pulls out with its roots, that's not factored in. It's purely um, erosion, water runoff, velocity, how it's considered. So, in terms of what we would do as a standard of care and standard of practice, um, it's more about what those state standards are. Um, you know, but we're happy to look at you know what that what that what those trees might be pulling out if you can direct us to that resource but it's not something that would be a regulatory feature in any of our any of our applications got it and and i think we can calculate that using the i tree um i canopy resources um online pretty easily so maybe i can go measure that and get back to you with some numbers on that just you know i i understand it's it's separate from the regulatory restrictions but mm -hmm. um, it might be an interesting calculation to consider mm -hmm. i'm Rachel, wondering I... oh, uh, the, i'm wondering about this water being held is is that like a normal thing to want to hold the water instead of like get it into a sewer or something i'm just thinking like mosquitoes like you know stagnant water yeah, that's a great question. The The existing storm mm -hmm. system today at Jones Library, let's go to maybe the existing conditions plan. It's a little bit easier to see. Um, the, any of the storm drains on site today go underneath the retaining wall to the fire department alley. So the fire department alley is down from the Jones Library site and grades continue to drop along um, North Pleasant Street. So this drain system goes out to the main storm drain system um, for the town, which is already kind of near capacity. Um, so any of that, any of that water that we'd be increasing, you know, with a bigger footprint and the increased increased water flows that we anticipate from climate change, all of that, we really don't want to increase anything going into the municipal system above what's today. Um, in terms of the mosquitoes, that is always a big issue. So one of the, the, the subsurface system we have that's below grade is not a place for mosquitoes. Um, and then the rain gardens are designed with a special media. It's like a 40% 40 40 sand, 20% compost, and 20% topsoil. That mix is a really quick drying um, material. Um, and the systems are designed so they don't hold water more than more than 72 hours, but most systems we've seen draining within 24 hours of a storm event. And one question I had is, will there be any trees in that specific area, either to be planted or to be capped, that will help intercept some of that stormwater? 
Yeah, we have um, we have the swamp white oak. We've got the sassafras, and we've got the willow oak. Those are all trees that that love love water, um, and they they should get pretty large in time too. But willow oak is not hardy now, and in, in this area, they you'll have serious dieback. Um, it would really struggle to survive in, in Amherst. Um, okay. Maybe another 15 years. But. So we're a little too aggressive in, our, too aggressive. <laughs> in our climate change solution. <laughs> um, if you have any ideas about something else that we would be using there, um, we would appreciate it. That we should be thinking about for the, for the willow oak. A tulip poplar could be interesting. Um, they're quite effective with carbon sequestration, right, Alan? And, um, mm -hmm. you know, they grow fast and provide shade quickly. So it might be something to consider. Sarah, I had a question. Sarah, sorry. Um, Rachel, I had a question. Did two questions. Did Berkshire Design Group do a, an analysis of the intercept of the second oak that's being removed for the stormwater? The intercept, the how much water it's pulling out? Yeah, did you calculate that intercept? No. It's over 2,000, I'm sure it's over 2,000 gallons, you know, a year, which overall isn't that much on the whole project probably, but, um, oh, what was the other question? Intercept. Yeah, Alan. Oh, um, Oh, to did, that point, um, we didn't calculate it because we, regardless of what it what it does, we'd still be held to the same stormwater standard, and we didn't have anywhere else on site to put the water. Um, we have to be twenty feet away from the edge of a building. We can't have water going back into the basement of the library. Okay, so, so that answers my next question, which was, did you investigate putting the stormwater cells under the pavement? Um, but you yeah. can't have it within 20 feet. Okay. That's where we originally thought. Um, and then also there's an electric duct bank for a mm -hmm. lot of buildings in the area that goes through there. Um, and we weren't able, we weren't able to get that get that, that to work. We did also introduce some subsurface piping out front underneath the lawn area um, to again help with that. We have a subsurface pipe in this area also to again help reduce the size of that footprint in the back. Um, and that takes mostly the roof water from the building. So today, a lot of the um, downspout gutters actually just flow freely on site. And we're actually intercepting those two and, and taking them. So again, minimizing the amount of um, mosquito issues on site. And just a curious, so this is, you know, beautiful, beautiful landscape plan. Um, lots of plants. Uh, as somebody who knows maintenance, um, maybe this is a question for Sherry. Is is this Sharon? Sorry, um, I mean, has maintenance costs been factored into this? I mean, this is huge. This is a lot of maintenance. I know stormwater um, gardens are not maintenance free by any stretch of the imagination. Um, again, no jurisdiction here, but <laughs> just it's it's going to be a lot of maintenance, and is that being factored into the project? Those costs. Uh, so I, I know Berkshire Design Group and the architects have been very aware, because uh, I think we've made it very clear that we need this to be as low maintenance as possible. Um, we haven't talked about what it's going to take uh, starting on day one, you know, once Rachel leaves us. Um, she may have to visit us once a week to help. No, honestly, I, I actually would love, uh, thank you for asking that question, and I would love Rachel to help yeah. with the answer. At, yeah, at, out front, we it'll definitely be easier than what's there now. Um, we've got simple simple plantings that don't require trimming. You know, they max out at the height that's wanted. Um, we're gonna, you know, reduce the amount of perennials and beds that require cleanup, and the the rest is is lawn. Um, the library could use a no mow fescue, which is just challenging to establish. So that's something that we can talk about on site if that's something that's desired, which could reduce the amount around of maintenance and, and mowing. Um, we've had success with that in town on other projects. It just takes, 
it takes maybe an extra season to establish in a lot of TLC up front, but it's something that um, you really only have to mow like once a year. Um, My question about maintenance or more concern, if you will, would be we as a committee already have a lot of stuff we're doing and also a lot of stuff that we put on the plate for Alan's department. And I just want to make sure that when this, if this new project, when it moves forward, that tree and grounds isn't being then asked after the fact to come and maintain it. Yeah. Thank you for the question. No, we, um, yeah, the library takes care of this, this okay. property. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, and then out then out back we have we have the, sh the shade trees we talked about. Um, we are proposing a mix of um, like she we're going to use sheet moss in the areas where the where the stepping stones are, and then we have a mix of uh, different types of varieties of carex as a under as a carpet throughout throughout the site, and then we have bulk plantings throughout there. So the idea is that there shouldn't be cutting or or trimming or maintaining, um, there will be initial investment needed in that establishment period just to keep the weeds out while things are growing in. Um, that definitely will be needed. And then the the stormwater features themselves um, will need um, inspections three to four times a year to make sure they're working um, and that no maintenance is needed. I just want to say one more thing. Um, and again, I think I think it's a really lovely, you know, generally speaking, uh, lovely proposal. Um, I do think it's such a shame that those large oak trees have to go. And I I um I don't have a sense of how old they are. And Alan, maybe you do. If if we're talking about like a hundred, you know, a hundred and fifty year old oak trees, um, there are ways to design with trees like this, and there's a really lovely project. Um, it's actually a library project that I'm familiar with. If if you just Google uh, Portland State Library, you'll see this beautiful library built around a large tree. And so, you know, I just I just want to put that out there that there are ways to preserve large trees, old trees. Um, and it's a shame that that hasn't been. I, I guess it probably has been considered, but it's a shame that that type of project is not an option. So I'll just. And let me, let me just say, so we've been working on this project for 12 years now. I kid you not. Um, but so rule number one, when we sat down with the architects and the landscape architects, we said, you need to save as many trees as you can. And and we pushed back several times. Um, you know, originally the 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 one that's living in the sewers, <laughs> you know, we were we that one didn't surprise us. But because it was so close to the building, we didn't know it was living out of the sewers. So um, so when that had to go, that didn't surprise us that much. The others, like the one that you're talking about that's high up on the mound, um, that that was a that was a bummer. And we did push back and then they explained they did all the math and the stormwater and the stormwater coming from the roofs and the strong house. And and they were just like, it just can't happen, Sharon. So um, so I, I had my mourning period. <laughs> and the, so I, I totally hear what you're saying. Um, uh, yeah. And, but I think, you know, once Jess comes back with those numbers, the number of trees being taken down versus what's being planted, we're definitely planting more than we're taking down. Are there any more questions or comments? We should probably move on. We have a long agenda. Um, I just want to say, uh, thanks for the presentation. The plans look really nice. Um, I know how much work and thought goes into projects like this, so I really appreciate your efforts. Uh, and I wouldn't be mad about seeing two swamp white oak back there. Um, okay. I think groupings of plants are lovely. The oaks are some of the trees that we were just talking about being sad about removing. Um, and they're one of the best trees for pollinators and it's going to, you know, fulfill the needs. Obviously you already have one in there. Um, I don't think there's a need to have to try to have a ton of variety in such a small space. I think, um, getting the sassafras in there and then having two of the same oak trees would, would totally be fine and, and look totally lovely. Great. Thanks. 
And Sarah, I think your uh, your partner there should come to every meeting. <laughs> it's just so lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm solo right now, so we're. we're doing dinner time on the fly, but thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> and Robert, you have your hand yeah. raised. Yeah, I, I, I just want to reiterate, I think that the team did a great job with the plan and I'm I'm sad about the oak tree too, but I realized the challenge they're faced with with regulatory because of stormwater management, you have to you have to handle that water on site. You can't you can't move it off site. It's the law now. The law has changed, it's different. And so Unfortunately, you have to dig down. So it is, it's sad about that oak. I'm sad too, but I think it's it's a reality of that site. I would put that that oak at about 75 years old, approximately, sort of looking at the size of it and the age of the buildings around it, because it doesn't predate the buildings, that's for sure. So I, I got to say that's sort of in that range. So I, I like the swamp white oak idea too. I think that's a great one to, to bring more oaks back there and also one that could take the water as well. So great job. My, my students have been working on this at UMass for many different studios. So it's nice to see uh, the final plans. They'll be thrilled. Thanks. Right. If there aren't further questions, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I'm personally looking forward to the new library, but uh, yeah, it is hard to see the trees come down. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you all so much for the time. Thank you for allowing us to answer questions. And if you have more questions that you think of tomorrow or tonight when you're laying your head down, reach out to me. No problem. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you Thank for you. sharing that. It was really great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And you're all welcome to stay if you want. Okay. So back to the agenda. Are you guys ready? Let me just... Uh, Shrink you down so I can see the agenda at the same time. There we go. Okay. Um, why don't you, everyone, email me your hours for the month, and I'll put that in. And um, <clears throat> can we approve the September minutes? Any comments about them? No? So all in favor of approving the minutes? And I guess there's two abstentions or anyone opposed? Can't remember if I read them. I'm just like I came because I wasn't there in September. <laughs> okay, it's good. For okay, people. yes, I I uh, I vote to approve the minutes. It's good to read the minutes, especially if you miss meetings, because I, uh, I did read them and I couldn't remember if I had or not, but I'm looking at them and I I definitely did. So yes. Okay, so the minutes are approved. Um, oh, I read them, but I can't approve them because I don't know. Yeah, yeah, like, I understand. good. <laughs> um. Things I have on my list, um, Phyllis, whatever her name is from the Gazette. Phyllis Laher. Phyllis Laher. Yeah, someone reaching out to her to tell them about the the work day on Saturday and about the um, tree tour on the Sunday, two weeks, a week from Sunday, I guess. I could send her an email. I believe I did last time. Yeah. Had the thing. Yep. Um, yeah, and then... Um, uh, oh, there's a, I guess Alan will talk about this, but the Mass Tree Wardens and Foresters are having their dinner on the 19th, if anyone wants to go. On the 12th, uh, the Wa Arboretum is having a tree walk at 4 o'clock. I'm planning to go to that. That's this Thursday. Um, it should be fun. And uh, what else to have? Oh, we need to talk about the Merry Maple Table. It's on the agenda. Good. Okay. And then the only other thing is maybe Alan can talk about the Elm Zigzag Sawfly. I mentioned that at the last meeting, but it'd be good to get more information about that. It's a new invasive pest of elms. So that's all I have right now. Um, Julian, do you have anything? Uh, I don't believe so, no. Okay. So Alan, over to you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, all right, so no tree hearings on the agenda that I'm aware of. Uh, we started putting out some of the um, uh, tree protection areas on the common, the North Common project. Um, so we're uh, two by fours up at the contractor installed the two by fours up around the trunks of the trees, and then we're installing uh, 
these uh, filter socks that kind of um, filter tubes that will define the no-go zone um, around the trunk flares, around the um, drip line of the trees. Um, and then we're going to pour more mulch in there um, to you know help mitigate some of the compaction that's already there. Um, so we hope to have that finished this week. They started doing the construction down on Boltwood where they're putting in a new sidewalk that runs along Boltwood on the north end of the North Common. Um, and then they're gonna start doing the work on the inside of the, the common. They're not planning on fencing off that area at all during construction from what I understand. So it's gonna stay pretty open um, and their equipment pretty much is gonna stay off of um, you know, the trees, which is really nice. Some of the trees there are gonna have, will have root impact from the project. Um, we minimized it as much as possible, but there will be some, definitely some tree roots being impacted by the project. But I think it's gonna be okay um, for the trees that we uh, preserved. Uh, we, on Kelagav, we have one project left of the sidewalk renovation there on Kellogg Ave, um, next to the Unitarian Church. Um, we were supposed to be putting down Perky Pave, and we've had a hard time finding a contract to do that. This is a rubberized uh, surface, kind of like the rubberized playgrounds, but it's actually, it's firmer. It is porous, um, and it's going to be applied around the trunks of the trees, you know, instead of asphalt, we're putting Perky Pave down so that the trees can um, uh, you know, get a little oxygen, uh, get some water, and not have asphalt over their roots, so we don't have to impact the roots as much um, next to the trunk of the trees. Um, we have uh, about six trees, seven trees going in at the the new West Street roundabout on the Pomeroy, West Pomeroy. Um, so that we're waiting for them to finish the stamping. They're doing this. If you've driven through there, you've seen they're stamping the asphalt with this textured brick-like surface um, so that um, it kind of defines the road from the non-road, but yet areas where you can actually still drive a vehicle in the center of the roundabout there for big trucks and stuff to drive on. So, uh, so that's the logic of having all of that extra paved area there? Yeah, the extra paved area that's not part of it, you know, regular driving is four large trucks that have to get through there. Got um, it. Okay. So. Yeah, I didn't understand why that wasn't being planted and was just more impervious surface yeah. area, but that makes sense. You they did the same thing on the Triangle Street roundabout. There's a there's a middle section there that is stamped. Uh, Great. It's so it'll look better when it's planted out. So it will. <laughs> the triangle one you don't you don't notice that much. So. The other thing I must say nice. the, the plantings around the Triangle Street one are really maturing nicely and um you know another 10 years, 15 years, it's going to be well treated over there. So, The other thing that is nice about those little areas is if you're um, maintaining the roundabout, it gives us good safe place to park, stay out of traffic, um, or if you're broken down or whatever. Um, and then uh, I did uh, hear from uh, Sharon Sherry that they are, they are interested in, um, if you're still looking for a home for the table, Mary Maple table, the library would love to um, give it a home in the new building. So um, just throwing that out there. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, we do have two students talking at the Western Mass Tree Wardens Dinner Meeting. It's the 19th um, from UMass and they're gonna talk about their research projects around um, Training some uh, uh, training that people how how different companies Miss Valley's train people, um, and I'm doing a terrible job describing this. And then uh, I can't remember what the other one is. I apologize. Um, it was a tough one to plan. I'd hoped to have four people, four students there, um, but had canceled last month, and then some people couldn't make this one, so we just have two students talking. But uh, Come mingle with other community, shade tree community folks, tree care industry folks, tree wardens if you want to. At the Blue Bonnet Diner. All right, thank That's you. All I have.
Thank you, Alan. Um, Treasurer. We have no change to our account. It is uh, the same as last month, which is $9,355.29. Okay, thank you. And social media, um, any news on that, Shoshana, Julian? No real news to report. Okay. All right, so on to library trees. Do we need to discuss that more? Are there any comments that people didn't make during the presentation? Um, it's a little loud on my end and I wasn't sure if I missed it or not, but um, is there anything that's planned for the use of the wood of the trees that are coming down either on site or in the library? Um, or is that something we should should, should suggest? Um, I can think of like, obviously it could be used in uh, art projects or something like that, like we did with the Mary Maple. Um, but I was wondering if it also could be used outside in the landscape, like a, a stumpery. I don't, I know that there's a lot of uses going on, um, but Great having, good. right, it's a good one. Having, um, you know, wood available on site uh, creates habitat and especially in a rain garden, if we're trying to attract pollinators, having, you know, bee hotels in places where they can overwinter and all that sort of thing is very beneficial. Um, so either in the building itself or an art project in the library or just left large cookies in the landscape. Um, but I I didn't know if anybody heard or something like that. It's very loud. That was I, have not, I have not heard about that you know, use, but um, it's a great idea. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of dimensional lumber in those two oak trees. I mean, it's, it's straight trunks. So um, if there's no metal in it, you know, they could make tables, all kinds of stuff be made um, for use in, inside the building. So. Yeah, so they're not, go. since they're not public trees, we don't really have a say over where they go or what happens to them. Um, but I guess, I i mean, I would be happy to reach out to them and be like a community liaison as I did with the Mary Maplewood. Um, I don't know if I can accommodate like massive, you know, like, you know, 10 foot pieces of trunk, but it could also be interesting to, um, like offer to run a workshop uh making little like pollinator houses as you suggested Sarah at the library and I I think that would be great I would be happy to do that too so maybe I should reach out to Sharon um and when is that when is when did they say construction was going to start going out to bid in 2024 so 2024 okay yeah that could be really fun I have a book coming out next year called Old Oak actually for kids and so it could be really fun to do something around that um, around the same time. So maybe I'll reach out to Sharon and um, also suggest like community, you making the wood available to community members in, in some way, even if it's small pieces or whatever they're, whoever's cutting down the trees is willing to do. So you could include me or CC me, Britt, if you reach out, cause I'm interested in helping. Cool. One question I forgot to ask. Is a contractor going to be removing those trees or will that be the DPW? So right now, as far as I know, it's going to be a con, you know, libraries where DPW has not been directly asked to do that work. So. Okay, cool. Uh, Julianne, I'll just offer on projects like this, typically when it goes out to bid, um, the demo is included as part of the construction. So it's going to go to a company who's going to do the whole thing. Um, and, and they might have subcontractors who specialize in tree removal for trees of this size, but it would all be under the same bid for the whole I see. So it's like one big bid rather than call up tree company X and demolition company Y. Yeah. R right, right. When the library goes out to bid, it will be for the entire project. And then it depends on who applies for the bid. It might be a team of people. It might be a huge company that does everything. Okay. It depends on who um, puts yeah. in a... a proposal, but Thanks it would all be included in the project. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, so if you can spread those 
messages to the library. Yeah, contact Sharon. Uh, that was great. And then uh, let's see, next, the work day is coming up Saturday. Alan, do you have trees? No. <laughs> no, we're just, we were just supposed to be doing, uh, getting their prep for it and uh, putting down mulch. We don't, we have to have species. We, you know, you and I are going to talk about species and then we have to get bare root stock. And then we have to have probably a, a day in November um, where we actually put the bare root stock in the grow bags and, and lay it all out. So, um, yeah, we're going to be spreading mulch and putting down landscape cloth and maybe putting some stakes in the ground to support the, the trees. Um, are, when we do get Alan, are, are you guys going to mow it and weed whack it and everything before Saturday? Yeah, we were going to run a mower down there and knock it down. Okay. Because it's really, as you saw in the photos. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm it's, down there frequently. Okay. <laughs> it's very overgrown. Yeah. So it's supposed to rain on Saturday. That might change. But what tools should we, as committee members, be bringing with us that would be useful? Just. Uh, well, we're going to be moving wood chips, okay. uh, wheelbarrows, okay. pitchforks. Iron rakes. Um, Bulls, yeah. We we'll uh, might be putting some stakes in the ground for to support the trees um, once we get them in, because so, they're being grow bags and they could blow over. Um, uh, yeah. Got it. Will Thank we you. be fixing the fence? Uh, someone's going to be fixing the fence. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You know, we don't have, um, you know, we need to put up some kind of temporary fence around the inside, you know, because um, the whole, we don't need the whole corral area. We only need a section of it. So um, some kind of snow fence or something um, or rabbit fence to keep rabbits out, uh, you know, um, you know, voles and moles might be the bigger problem there. Um, but if we keep the grass down um, and keep the trunks exposed and just the root, roots, uh, grow bags covered, um, the trees should be okay. Maybe we want to use some of that orange fencing that was at Kinder Park. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Some of the, they call it snow fence or construction right. fence, you know. Um, Yeah, we, you know, we need to know how many trees we plan on growing. We really haven't discussed, you know, are we going to do 10, five species, 10 each? Uh, are we going to, you know, I what kind we, of commitment are we looking at here? Um, I think we talked about doing three species, 10 trees each. So 30, 30 trees? Yeah, I think that's a reasonable amount we can accomplish. And there's a guy who lives on um, High Street who I just um, dug up some sassafras trees from his yard and planted them here. But he has a number of seedlings of um, uh, tulip tree. Paul Peel, he did talk to you at one point, Alan. Um, so I'd be happy to dig those up to put them in if you think that would be appropriate. Yeah, you know, I was thinking like as far as species go, we can't buy, for some reason, it's very difficult to buy a shag bar kickery. <laughs> I can't, I can't get one um, locally. So, you know, it's one species that we don't plant a lot of because we can't get it. And I have had a number of requests for it. Um, I mean, it's good habitat tree, um, but, um, or pig nut, shag bark, pig nut hickory. Um, Well, we can grow them from nuts. I did collect uh, a number of uh, shagbark hickory nuts. Uh, Squirrels have been planting avocados in my yard, so they've been picking through my compost pile. And I was doing a walk around the other day, and I got like three avocado trees growing in my yard. Oh. <laughs> That's great. So. Well, the climate keeps warming. That's, they might That's for long. Yeah. Till winter. I have squirrels um, planting my hazelnut trees. I found the third one now. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. and some other oaks too. It'd be nice to plant mm -hmm. some of the other, you know, nice oaks that, you know, maybe, you know, we can generally get oak trees, like, you know, white oak, swamp white oak, um, red oak, pin oak, but, um, you know, do we want to look at sawtooth? Do we want to get some of the other um, species that we don't see a lot of, you know? Chestnut oak or scarlet oak? Chestnut oak, yeah, chestnut oak. Do we want to decide that now or? Yeah, I mean, the sooner we make a decision, the sooner I can start reaching out to uh, growers who have bare root stock that I can purchase this month, you know, for next month, so. Somebody want to make a proposal of three species? <laughs> so I have shagbark hickory, tulip, chestnut oak, those three. I like it. It might be good to have a variety of sizes, right? Because one of the things we encountered with the tulip trees when we were trying to give those out was that people didn't want something quite so large. Hmm. <laughs> well, these are for street trees. Street trees. So yeah. then there's no, people don't really have much of a say. <laughs> well, they do, but it also, yeah, I mean, some places you can't plant large trees, but I think the smaller trees are easier to get Maybe, I don't know. Is that true, Alan? You mean for, for Arbor Day events and stuff like that, you mean? No, 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 for buying for street trees. If we, you know, these are gonna be trees that we save money by planting ourselves. Yeah. But should we plant us, should we get, um, I guess Britt was suggesting we maybe do one smaller size tree and I'm saying maybe not because those are easy enough to get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, easy to get, but they're still expensive, you know? So, I mean, if there was a, you know, if you wanted a filbert, you know, if we wanted to grow more filbert trees, um, that's not something we get a lot of um, at nurseries. Um, they're sure. kind of a medium-sized tree. Yeah. So which one should we take out to get that in? I'd take out the tulip because they are readily available in the area. Um, okay. But... Um, yeah, they grow was, fast. I mean, they would be ready to go in like two years. So. Yeah. Hick or hickory, that hickories uh, are a nice option, I think. I have a hickory in my yard and it's dropped lots of nuts and they're just popping up all over the place and they seem like they grow pretty, you know, pretty, not as fast as a tulip tree, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, reasonably fast. Yeah. It's a hickory, the Turkish hazelnut and the chestnut oak. Sure. I'm favoring nut trees here, but that's not a bad thing. Catalpas are, are catalpas native? Yeah. Yeah, yeah catalpas are a nice, I don't see those at nurseries, but they're a beautiful large tree that seem like they pop up all over the place too, so. Would it be good to have a tree in there that um, like, there's always like that person that complains about you know, like the tree dropping stuff like acorns or whatnot. And um, I'm worried that if we have all nut trees alternative for like that person. Yeah, I understand. Kind of, some kind of maple. Maples aren't doing too well, right? Yeah, the I sugars red, aren't definitely. Red maple. Yeah, we could do a red maple. I like that idea. A non, like a just a native Isarubrum, you know, non uh, cultivar. Yeah, seedlings if possible, but I know they'd be hard to get. But so there's some genetic diversity. Uh -huh. Um. Well, we have to make a decision, and we it's twenty of seven. I'd like to end by seven, if at all possible. Well, we could do 40 trees instead of 30 trees. Okay. Let's do that. Sure. Okay. 40 trees, red maple, Turkish hazels, hickory, and chestnut oak. Sure. Chestnut oak. Sounds good. Okay. 
All in favor? Okay. Aye. Aye. Okay, good. Thank you. Good. All right, so we'll see you Saturday. I believe my son and his girlfriend are going to come join us and help us. So that'll be nice. Um, they're strong young people. <laughs> okay, town tree inventory. What are the next steps on that? Uh, if people are interested in maybe helping and we can help. Yeah, so I don't, you know, I apologize for not making it to the last event, um, Saturday event. Um, I don't know what you ended up accomplishing. Um, not uh, sure where we left off with it, but uh, we have a lot of streets in town to inventory. Um, and I, I guess I need to know from the committee, you know, after doing those two kind of inventory tests, um, learning experiences, do you feel it's something you want to take a bigger bite into? Um, I mean, do, do people have the time to hit the roads and, and inventory trees? Yeah, I would like to do it. Um, I feel fairly confident. We had a bunch of questions. Um, Julian, did you send them to Alan? I questions don't. about the app. So, um, I can do that right now, though. Uh, would you prefer if I text them or email them to you, Alan? Email's good. Okay, great. Yeah, we had a couple of issues with the app, and then we're wondering um, if this is the app we're actually going to use, and they're going, it's going right into the inventory, or how that's going to, what's the interface? Yeah, so um, the app that um, Dave Bologna has introduced the committee to, and that's what you used on the second event as well, mm -hmm. um, you know, it does not interact directly with our inventory. Mm -hmm. So um, we have to, you know, take that data and then try to get to merge with our tree inventory data. So um, it does not give you a point. You know, you can't drop a point yeah. on a map. You get a latitude longitude, um, which can be off by, you know, five feet <laughs> pretty easily. Um, so you, get, you end up with points all over the place um, when you start looking at it in GIS. Um, so that's a problem. Um, and then converting the the data so that it matches up with what we have in our in our tree inventory. Um, it doesn't seem to be. It's it's a great app for for doing stuff, but it doesn't seem to be. From what I said with my conversation with our JIS folks, um, probably is not ultimately going to work for us. Um, but there is an app that um, Esri, the company we use right now for GIS. Uh, does make a free app that can be used. Um, um, what we were hoping to get was a bunch of data that you collected uh, the last time around. Um, if someone wants to, if I can get a hold of that, um, we can see how it's going to, much work it's going to take to make it work with our inventory. He, he was excited. So he's like, this is great. Um, let's, let's try it. You know, go ahead, send them out, collect a bunch of data. We'll pull it in. And then see how do we can work with it. Um, so, if I can get that, we'll see. I think I think we just need to use the app that Esri offers uh, for free, and you just download it onto your phone, basically, and um, go around and collect data that way. So. Yeah, ahead, I want. I just wanted to add. So I have a UMass student who's working with me and one of her tasks is to do some research on kind of best practices uh, in um, tree inventory work and talk to Dave and kind of figure out like what is the model that might be useful for our committee to use. And she also wants to develop um, an engage like a community engagement plan um, mm -hmm. that mobilizes, you know, however many volunteers we need um, including uh, leaders who are forestry students at UMass who can kind of, you know, lead little cohorts or little groups of folks um, in this updating. So she's working on that. I'm going to get an update from her on Thursday this week. And, you know, if we have the technical side down, you know, whatever, whatever app we decide to use, you know, 
um, she and I are kind of strategizing on the, on the other side of things, like logistically, how do we make this happen? So mm -hmm. I will provide an update um, when I chat with her. So that's something that the committee thinks we want to do in the spring. Um, I have to have the, I have to, so we have the inventory has the, the management plan, urban forestry master plan or management plan um, that I need to work on. Um, and then we have the actual tree inventory part of it. So um, come June, I need to have everything wrapped up. Um, uh, so I got to chip away at some stuff this winter and then in the spring really hit the ground running with the inventory. Yeah, I was, and I, I can was, do that. Is it something for the we contractor can... as well? So, okay, what? I missed that. I said I could also hire. I mean, my for the majority of that work, I could I could go out and hire an individual to to do the inventory, um, and then leave certain areas for the committee to try to fill in. You know, the areas. No, I think um, we enjoyed it when we were out doing it, and I think um, I think it's a good project for the committee, and it would bring in some outside people to help. Also, um, I assume we can't do it in the winter because we can't. This questions that we don't always know the answer, like species without leaves. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can definitely do tree inventories in the winter time as long as you just have to know how to do tree, tree ID. Yeah, with twigs <laughs> and buds and bark. So. So maybe we should wait till spring, but I think that's a great thing for us to do. I mean, would anybody want to meet like for a cup of coffee someday or something and kind of just really, it's difficult to do it on Zoom <laughs> to, uh, you know, really look at how we want to organize people and data, you know, collecting and stuff like that. Um, sure. It's, um, yeah, I'd be happy to help with that. I'm less helpful on the data side of things, but on the people side of things. Um, and then on the the broader, you know, urban forestry plan, um, anything that I or this student can be helpful with um, that you're going to be chipping away at, Alan, just just let me know. I, I also have her working on um, looking at those public housing areas in Amherst mm -hmm. and kind of scoping out what might be possible there as a first step, um, followed by potentially like community engagement with folks to see what they're open to, to see what's possible um, and to hear what they're interested in. Um, and she was working on one other thing. I can't remember what it was, but, but I'll have updates on, on that front. And again, you know, she's kind of just doing some research, coming up with ideas. Obviously all of this comes to the committee first be thing, before anything, um, happens. But, you know, the idea was after this meeting with Dave Bloniarts to, um, get some UMass power behind, you know, getting, getting some of this work started. So, Great. Definitely. Great. I'd be great. interested in attending. Um, all right. So let's, um, I'd be interested in that. Anyone else? And then we can just set a meeting with Alan. Okay. So one of the, the three of us, Alan and Britt and I will, we'll plan a meeting and we'll, we'll do that. Okay. I'm okay. I'm happy to help Alan if there's anything with the management plan, um, reviewing the old plan, updating it, or whatever new ideas you may have or the committee may have. Um, I'm happy to help with that also. Okay, great. Thank you, sir. Great. Okay. Um, town tree tour. We've picked the date October 22nd. Is that still good with you, Ellen? Yep. Okay. Can and can we pick a time to meet and do the walk the route before? Why the, don't you do? Sure, it's coming up soon. Yeah, let's um, let's talk after the meeting. Okay. All right. So yeah, keep it on your calendar. Get it on your calendar. Get it on the public media on the the social media. The Sunday, what? October twenty second at one p.m. 1 p.m. Okay. Okay. UMass interns, Britt, you already brought that up. 
The Mary Maple table should be donated to the library. Do you want to make that decision now? If they'll take it. Yeah, Alan said they were interested. Okay. They want it before the renovation? Or is it going to sit in my barn for two years? I, I don't care. <laughs> Barn's a disaster, but I'm just curious. And I would say we should also try to get, if if we go that route, a little plaque or something that goes on it that says what what this is. Should it go to the library or to special collect? Well, I guess special collections isn't, they they won't want it. Yeah, I would ask Sharon, you know, ask Sharon, Sherry, if, if they want it, then um, when do they want it? And uh, if, they, if they're going to, do we want to just write something up Give them with the table and have them put the you know, plaque on it or make the story up. Goes since I have to email Sharon anyway, I, and since I have the table, I can I can ask about that as well and start that conversation if the committee thinks that is a good you know home for it. Yeah, I think it's a good home. I would maybe want to just have a condition on that it's a sort of long-term permanent loan, but if they didn't want the table, it should go back to the tree committee to decide what to do next. So, is everyone in favor of this? Yes, I'm in favor of that long-term loan idea so that, yeah, it would come back to the tree committee if they decided that they didn't have room for it or something like that in the future. Okay. Would we need like an MOU then or something? What's an MOU? Memory. Like a, like a, yeah. yeah, like okay. some kind of way to keep that information alive, even if the directorship of the library changes and the tree committee changes. And yes, and it could go on a, it could go on something like underneath the table, the bottom of the table, or something. But like a, you know, a permanent loan from public history committee. If you, you try, know. if you try to chip this tree, it'll like ink all over you or something. <laughs> Chip, chip this table. Okay. Okay. So I can do uh, that. I write labels for a living, so I can certainly write a label for it. Okay. So Britt will talk to the library. Ellen will make the label. <laughs> and all in favor of this? Okay. Good. All right. Um, seven minutes to seven. Anything else we need to talk about? There's no nothing new on state level initiatives on my end. Significant tree ordinance. Anything new? No. Uh, Solar bylaw group, Julian. Nothing. And the love letters, Mary Maple love letters. I haven't done anything with that. Yeah, we have a lot of things we're planning that's almost too much for the committee, but um, I think getting the nursery started and um, getting the table off of the agenda and things like that would be great. So I think we've made some progress. Anything else? Anyone else want to say anything? Um, I'm just worried about the tree tour. If we just um, advertise through social media, is that going to be enough? Do we need to put flyers up somewhere or is there any other way to generate interest? I think if you get it in the indie with Art Keen, um, if you send that, if you, if there's a blurb or write up or something, I can send it to Art Keen. Yeah. I think the deadline is Wednesdays. Is that right? For uh, some, Wednesdays they, or Thursdays. Yeah. It may be. It Thursday. comes out. I know it comes Thursday out. At 9 Saturday, Saturday. Thursday at 9 a.m. Okay. Okay. I could write something up and send it to you, Britt. Okay. Um, should go to the India. It should go to Scott Mersbach. Yeah. Go I can send Phyllis. it to both of them. Julian, you mentioned to send it to Phyllis. Um, and then, um, it can go on the town website to go on our website. I can put it there and, uh, go out, um, Ben had already sent it out with the last e-newsletter and there'll be at least one more before then. So, okay. Yeah. He put out the wrong, uh, date for the workday on that, but he, then he could. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's, that's probably good. Um, if someone wants to make a flyer and put a few up in town, that'd be great, but. Any volunteers? <laughs> I, that's plenty. I don't think we need to flyer if we're we're hitting those other 
okay. yeah. areas. I think the indie is a good idea. Okay, good. All right, so uh, yeah, Shoshana and Julian, get that up on social media as soon as possible. Yeah. Are you going to be making a little thing for it, um, or should I put it up separately? I'll write something up, and I'll send it to the group. Uh, okay, great. I'll wait for that. Then. I'll do that tomorrow. Sounds good. Um, I just wonder if we need to say something about it um, being, you know, just in case some of the same people are on, you know, it's going to be the same tour. It's just at a different time of year. Yeah. So, you know, referencing, um, you know, the trees we looked at in Good. the spring, come see how they change in the fall or, you know, something to, to let people know it's the same walking route. You know, it's not a brand new tour. Uh, I just don't want anyone to be disappointed. I don't think anyone will be disappointed, but yeah, it's a good idea to do that. So, yeah. Good. Anything else? No? All right. Well, thank you all. Don't forget to email me your hours for the month, and we'll see you Saturday. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. The meeting's all done. The meeting's all done. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye.